go back and look at lecture nine for a moment and review a couple of things. So um, among other things, we talked about Lie's algebra, um, which uh, looks like the Kovanov algebra, but when you take the coproduct on X, you have an extra one tensor one, and the square of X is equal to one. And if you change basis with it to red and green, red being one plus X over two and green being one minus X over two, then you find that the co-units are one half and minus one half for red and green and, and that red and green satisfy and more, somewhat more easily remembered algebra where R squared is R and G squared is G, R plus G is one and R and G multiply to zero. And the co-products are um, up to multiple of two, R tensor R and minus G tensor G. And we've been looking at that uh, and some things about it. In particular, one of the things that we looked at is that if you take a classical diagram and you uh, color it in two colors, red, green, red, green, just alternately, whenever you go through a crossing, switch color, um, then you find that you can do that. Um, and that remarkably for classical diagrams, if you then smooth according to color, um, well, you'll find that you get a collection of curves which don't touch themselves, but touch the other curves. And of course, since RG is equal to zero, that means that the boundary of this element in the chain complex for Lie homology is zero. So we get lots and lots of cycles in the Z complex, in the, in the, in the complex. And uh, we want to see that there are no self-touching cycles. And this comes about because of another coincidence. And that coincidence is that the smoothing for the two coloring in the Lie algebra turns out to be the same as the Seifert smoothing. If you put arrows on the diagram and make an oriented diagram out of it, um, and then take the smoothings that are oriented smoothings of those crossings, you find that you get exactly the same smoothings as the two color smoothings. And uh, this is not really a mystery. This is rather easy to understand because if you start at a given point and walk along a loop until you come back to the point where you started, then you are going to find yourself going through an even number of crossings as you go through. Um, you are in this example here, you go through an even number because all these other lines in the plane pair up in the end and give you an even number due to the Jordan curve theorem. But if you go through an even number, that means that if you started with G and you went around the loop, you would end at G. And so if you start outside the loop at R, uh, then you'll end up outside the loop at R. And that is exactly the cipher oriented smoothing of the crossing. So for classical knot diagrams, the, the color smoothings coincide with the cipher smoothings. Now, cipher smoothings can't uh, be touching themselves because of the orientation. And I think I illustrated, this is what I was just saying, and I illustrated how a cipher smoothing can't touch itself because it would be going in the wrong way if it touched itself, it would be disoriented. And cipher smoothings all look like this. So this tells us how to get the cycles in the Lie homology. And so it turns out, if you analyze it a little further, that the Lie homology is in fact generated by those cycles, which um, I just described. And I left it to you to prove that a little more carefully, and I still leave it for you to prove that a little more carefully. We will do it next week. Um, and, uh, and then I talked about how this becomes uh, a different story, but a very similar story in virtuals, because for virtuals, you have the you have a generalization of the classical cipher surface. So um, in virtuals in classicals, you have the cipher surface where you take the cipher smoothing 
and then you add disks to each of the circuits and put little twists back in and you get a spanning surface for the knot that's orientable if you um now let me ignore that for a moment i see uh, maybe i have to jump in these slides to indicate the part that i wanted to talk about for a moment let me jump i'm reviewing but i'm sure it doesn't hurt to review um there it is so uh this is the way spanning surfaces work but uh if you if you do something similar with a cobordism you also get a spanning surface but you get a spanning surface that is pushed into four space into the four ball thinking of the three-dimensional sphere as bounding a four ball and what we do is we go through a saddle point one per crossing and you see that that means using an entering line and a leaving line so that these are oppositely oriented when you bring them together and you can go through an oriented saddle point and you see that when you do that it has the same formal structure as producing the ciphered circuits. If you had if you had smoothed it right here, you would have the middle circuit in the same way. So, um, so in fact, if you think about this construction, which is a four dimensional construction, we go through these saddle points, and then we have a collection of circles, and these circles are in the four ball, and they're all unknotted, and we bound them off with disks. And going all the way down into the four ball in that way gives us a surface whose boundary is the knot that is living in the four ball. But that surface, and that's another nice exercise for you to think about, that surface is the same as if you were to take ciphered surface and push it gently into the four ball. Now this, this construction we can still do for virtuals. And we do it in the same way. I'm illustrating it here. Um, I go through a saddle, I go through a saddle for the classical crossings in the virtual diagram. And I don't do anything about the virtuals. And once again, I get a collection of circles, in this case, only one. And, I'm and it is a trivial virtual knot. And it then bounds off a disk in virtual four space. And so I get a virtual spanning surface for the trefoil knot or for any virtual knot by this method. And you can check by an Euler characteristic calculation that the genus of the surface that you get is one half of uh, R minus R, where R is the number of these ciphered circles, plus N, where N is the number of classical crossings, plus one. And so we call I call that the virtual ciphered surface. And it is a surface in the four ball that bounds in the virtual four ball that bounds our virtual knot. And we would like to know um, uh, um, whether that it might in some cases be the least genus surface. But of course, in many cases, it's not at all the least genus surface, but we do know that it is in some cases. And in general, we would like to know what is the least genus surface in this sense that bounds um, a virtual knot in the virtual four ball. So, so we have that surface, that virtual ciphered surface. And let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Well, I'll come to the theorem in a moment, but let's go back to where we were. Because what we're going to find is that we can generalize the coloring theorem in this Lee homology when we do the Lee homology for virtuals, we can generalize the coloring theorem so that we get the ciphered smoothings again and cycles, and we'll be able then to relate things to the genus of the virtual ciphered surface. So let's see how that's going to go. I don't have to show you everything that we were doing last time. Here I'm just I'm just showing you these slides in case you want to look at them again. You have them now in your possession, either through the Dropbox or through NSU. Um, and um, this was working on checking the genus by using the Euler formula. 
And then here's a nice exercise that we did um, in a slightly different order last time. I said, consider a torus knot, like a 4-3 torus knot. And let's think about the classical spanning surface for the 4-3 torus knot. So we want to do ciphered smoothings at all these crossings. And these are all positive crossings, the way I've chosen it. And you see, I'll draw it in the next slide, that I get a bunch of ciphered circles that are just concentric circles going up through this in a nest. And uh, for the KPQ, for the K43, for example, you see each of these four blocks has three crossings. That's four minus one. And there are three of those blocks. So we get four minus one times three crossings in the knot. And in general, P minus one times Q crossings in the standard diagram for a KPQ torus knot. And when we make the cut, we're going to have a P ciphered circles. So just like this. So that's KPQ, and I have four ciphered circles. So I have that many crossings and that many ciphered circles like that. Um, and then we'll use that example in a moment. And then I was summarizing about the Lee homology um, and how the Rasmussen invariant gets used without going into the details of the construction of the Rasmussen invariant, which I won't this, this time either, but next time we may be uh, spending, maybe next time we'll spend an hour about the, the actual construction of the Rasmussen invariant for classical and virtual. But what you do is you filter the complex with the grading um, um, of um, uh, that can occur for the Lee cycles. So I'm interested in thinking about a Lee cycle and what its grading might be. And, uh, and then you look at the maximum of the quantum grading for the Lee cycle, and then you minimize that, and you also maximize that, and you take the average, and that's Rasmussen's invariant. So, Russ, so when I'm talking about the, the uh, grading for the cycle, it's a normalized grading. So we use this, which is the same as the factor on the Jones polynomial that makes it invariant. And this is the J that we're used to for getting the quantum grading. And with that in mind, you, you, can, you then have Lee, Rasmussen's invariant. So Rasmussen's invariant involves using the Lee homology and then comparing it with the, uh, with the Kavana homology in the right way. And you find that it's a concordance invariant of the knot, that it's additive under connected sum, that it changes under uh, to its negative under mirror image. And if you have a positive knot diagram, then the Rasmussen invariant turns out to be equal to twice the genus of the ciphered surface, as you see, that's our formula for the ciphered surface genus. And in the case of the torus knot, um, the Rasmussen invariant turns out of type PR, I usually use Q there, um, P minus one times R minus one. In other words, twice the genus of the ciphered surface. Uh, and, and, um, and that means because of six, the key property of the invariant, that, it's a, that it is bounded um, a by uh, twice the genus of the four ball genus of the knot, um, one can conclude that the four ball genus of the torus knot is exactly its ciphered genus. And in fact, one can conclude that the four ball genus of a positive knot is twice its ciphered genus, is, is equal to its ciphered genus, excuse me. Um, so, um, so that's a very beautiful consequence of Rasmussen's invariant, which is obtained by comparing Lee and Kavana homologies. And we can apply this. I can show you how that calculation works in the case of the torus knot. You see, if I'm writing PQ now. If I have PQ torus knot, 
Then I have P loops and P minus one times Q crossings. So the Q, remember the Q? The Q is the J, um, and there are no Bs. When the J is the number of B smoothings, of which there are none, and then the number of ones minus the number of Xs. Well, when you use the Rs and the Gs to make that state, you have Xs on every line. So you're going to have a maximal number of Xs. And so we end up with minus P for that part of the grading, and then plus P minus one Q. And you calculate that, you see, and you get P minus one times Q minus one minus one. And, uh, and that grading result implies that the Rasmussen invariant, I remind you, the Rasmussen invariant formula that I have here, um, that the max and the min differ by two. And when you take their average, the one will go away and you will get P minus one times Q minus one. And that's how that calculation looks. The calculation depends, as you see, on, on the fact that that colored state is related to the cipher smoothing the way it was. And we could, actually we should, maybe as an exercise between now and next time, do the same uh, exercise of calculation on the basis of those facts about the Rasmussen invariant for an arbitrary positive knot and see that you will get the same result that the Seifert genus is equal to the uh, four ball genus. Um, some uh, comments that I started to make last time, I'll amplify a little this time that uh, there is um, a version of, of Kovana homology called Rushworth's double Kovana homology which handles what happens to the colorings when you don't put any um, on a virtual knot, when you don't put any cut points on it. So you might have asked, well, uh, just what does happen to the um, colorings of a virtual knot? And the answer is uh, for a knot, it's always colorable. For a link, sometimes you can't to color it. But when you do color it, it isn't necessarily going to give you the ciphered smoothings. Look at this example for the virtual trefoil flattened diagram. You see, um, the smoothing occurs this way, the ciphered smoothing occurs that way. Interesting. Hmm? Um, and um, in fact, there is a, a, a polynomial invariant uh, similar to the bracket that I defined a long time ago called the binary bracket that uh, is directly related to these kinds of colorings. And, and the binary bracket is actually what's being categorified by Rushworth's doubled cohomology in the Lee case. And we will see that later. Um, so that's something looking forward. But now the other thing, and this is where I was saying last time, we get the connection with our version of virtual Kovana homology. Remember what we did to set up the virtual Kovana homology. We started with the standard orientation on the knot. And then we formed the um, um, source sync orientation, where I, I keep the right hand side orientations exactly as they were, but I put in reverse orientations go in, go out, instead of go in, go out, and get a source sync orientation there. And then I put cut points here so that the rest of the diagram can do exactly as it did before. And now we have a diagram with cut points. And you can color the diagram with cut points. And here's an example. You see, I'm coloring the diagram with cut points now. and and then you will find that once again, we're back in the situation where the smoothings from the coloring are exactly the same as the ciphered smoothings, where by ciphered smoothings, of course, I mean that you take an oriented smoothing for each oriented crossing, and you don't do anything at all at the virtual crossing. So once again, these colorings 
correspond to the Seifert smoothings. And so we can count them in terms of orientations of links and orientations of knots. And, um, and you can also check to see that, um, uh, you can check to see what happens um, uh, to the cycles. And I have a better example than this one or another example here. Um, oh, well, this is a good example and I have another one as well. In this example, is, which is the one on the previous slide, but a little easier to look at, you see that when we take the smoothing, um, we're getting um, we're getting something with um, with states that are uh, touching themselves. So we need to take co-products here. Um, Have I gotten myself into a confusion? Maybe not. Oh, no, not at all. I'm sorry. It's not a matter of taking co-products here. Um, it's a matter of, of the single cycle map. So in this case, you see, um, I when I re-smooth this, I get a single cycle. And the single cycle map is zero for me. So this is still a cycle in the Kravana phenomenology. And I've done another example here. Here's a virtual figure eight knot. And I have put the cut points in for each of the crossings, two of them there. And uh, the orientation is going this way, so I have two cut points there, and the orientation going this way, and two cut points there. Now I forget the orientations; I'm just looking at the cut point structure. Now, one once one, I, I I show you this because you may want to try some examples yourself. Then you look at the cut point structure, and you can simplify it often because if you have two cut points in a row, uh, then it's as though you didn't have any cut points at all, so you might as well eliminate them. So I can eliminate these two, and I can eliminate these two, and I'm left with two here and here. And then I took the coloring, and um, and I have this setup. And as you see, what happens here is that I have some multiplications, and they're all zero, and I have some single cycle maps, and they're also zero. So this is giving me a uh, a cycle in the Lee homology. And so what happens is that you are going to get a cycle in the Lee homology, but um, but it you are not seeing so clearly at this stage, and it won't be the case that such cycles will always be non-trivial in the homology. Um, but if these were all A smoothings, then we're at the left-hand end of the complex and no, no boundaries can come in. So in the case where, and that's where the fact that, um, that this is an oriented knot and all the crossings are positive. You see, if I assume that, if I assume that I have an oriented knot and all the crossings are positive, why then, uh, I will be, the A smoothing will be the same. The A smoothing of this is the same as the oriented smoothing. Um, and that means that the, um, that the, that I'm in the A state and I have this cycle in the all A state situation in the zeroth part of the complex. And it's definitely a cycle and it's not a boundary. So I have a non-trivial homology class to work with. And then the analog, the exact analog of the Rasmussen argument supplies, and you can conclude exactly as Rasmussen does that uh, that the um, you get a non-trivial homology class here, and the Rasmussen invariant can be computed in that way. So the computation of the Rasmussen invariant becomes for positive virtual knots exactly the same as it is for classical 
virtual knots. And that's our story in getting this theorem here. So uh, what I want to do and will work on for next time is give you a, um, a concise one hour presentation of how the Rasmussen invariant actually is getting constructed both classically and in terms of, um, of virtuals using our virtual Kovana homology. But the result that one gets is exactly analogous to Rasmussen calculation for a positive classical knot. You get that the four ball genus of a positive virtual knot is given by the genus, the four ball genus, uh, by the genus of its virtual cipher surface. So that's partly a review of last time and partly an extension of what I said last time into today. Okay. Now, um, what I want to talk about today is um, a change of context for some of this that is, in fact, related to uh, what I started to tell you about in relation to the binary bracket. And uh, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, which is, and you'll see it's related to some graph theory. Um, and just a moment, I'll get the blackboard. So, so we were saying that if we take a virtual diagram I'm just taking a random example, um, we take a virtual diagram and orient it. and color it. and look at the smoothing structure. Oh, then um, some of some of these crossings are ciphered smoothings, like that's a ciphered smoothing, and that's a ciphered smoothing, um, and there's another ciphered smoothing, <clears throat> but this one isn't. And um, this one isn't. And so we don't get a perfect coincidence between cipher smoothings and color smoothings when we're looking at a virtual diagram. Um, and, and so uh, this suggests that there should be an invariant of virtuals that would be related to the way this works. And in fact, there is, um, and um, uh, I'm going to show you a polynomial invariant, but uh, you also know another one, which has to do with discriminating between things that have odd 
uh, the crossings that are odd and crossings that are even, which is what the discrimination really is here. You see, when you have a cipher smoothing, you're talking about an even cross, you're talking about a crossing that's even. Um, for example, here, we go through this loop and we come back to where we started. And how many crossings did we meet? We met one, two, an even number. On the other hand, this one, which was not ciphered, as we went through the loop, we, we met one, and that was it, and it was odd. So what you're actually seeing are the odd crossings and the even crossings. And then we have previously talked about parity and various kinds of invariants that involve parity. Um, so, so that's really what, what is going on here. Um, but I want to explain to you um, a, um, a method of, um, of, of getting an invariant um, in the following way. Um, I'm going to define a bracket. Um, hmm. I always use the same notation for all the brackets I'm working with. And I guess I'm going to do that again, but maybe I'll just use a square, square bracket for this. I want to talk about the binary bracket. And if you want to think of it as something like the bracket, then you can do it this way. You can say the evaluation of the knot is equal to A times the evaluation of it under a certain condition plus A inverse times the evaluation of it under a certain condition and the value of a loop is going to be equal to two. And the condition means that these are colored differently. And then for the binary bracket, the one that's going to give us topological information, there are two colors. Which we may, in relation to what we were doing before, call them red and green. And then you see you're going to get a polynomial, the lump polynomial in day and day inverse. Hmm? Um, and um, and and uh, the um, the evaluation for the knot is going to be equal to a sum over all the colorings of a to a power associated with the coloring. Right, that's what's going to happen here, and um, and then there's going to be a an evaluation of a loop and loop evaluation. But um, the point I want to make is that uh, this will, for links, uh, unoriented links, this will be an invariant of regular isotopy, virtual regular isotopy of what you're looking at. And let, let's just play with it for a few minutes and see that it's really going to work. Okay. And then to find out the evaluation, you just need to look at colorings there and um, and see what evaluation you have to take. And already you've seen that it's going to be very simple in the case of a classical link. But in the case of a of 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 a non-classical link, it's going to involve something about the odd crossings versus the even crossings, as you can see.
So let's see how how this is going to look if you were if you were going to just examine its behavior under a rhodomized remove. So um, so this is going to expand into And you remember this means colored differently, right? And then we will expand it one more time. And we're going to get A times A times All right. Okay. Now, um, let me just simplify that a bit. So I get A squared. plus plus All right now what can happen here this is, this is being asked to be colored differently from itself. So that can't happen. This is being asked to be colored differently from itself. So that can't happen. This just says that these two are colored differently. And now what about this? What is happening here? Um, you might've colored this green, for example, in which case this would have to be red, in which case this would have to be green and they're colored the same. And of course it could have been the other way around. You could have had this one is colored red, in which case this is colored green, and then this would be colored red. So, um, so in each case, I'm getting a single colored loop. Um, and um, and a different color here. Now, I should have said that the value of the loop is equal to the value of a red loop plus the value of a green loop, and they're each one. And that's why I am taking the value of the loop to be equal to two, okay? But here, you see that each individual loop is, lay, is, is, is valued one. And so we are going to get the situation where this is colored differently from this is colored equal sorry we're getting the situation where these are equally colored and we're getting the situation where these are differently colored and now let's use our logic equally colored that way is the same as equally colored this way plus colored differently and then this is the same as two parallel lines because two parallel lines are either same or different. And so you see, there is a simple coloring argument which is telling us that it's invariant under the second Reitermeister right remove. And once it's invariant under the second Reitermeister right remove, we can get it to be invariant under the first Reitermeister right remove 
and by uh, I mean under the sec under the third randomized move by the usual trick, right? The usual trick is to use the second randomized move. So I remind you that trick will still work. That we want invariance under the third randomized move. So we say, okay, I have I have set it up so that um, uh, I could expand it, and once I've expanded it, it looks like this, where this is told to be different from that, and then um, and then this, where this is told to be different from that, and and then you can go through and I will just say, et cetera, and let you check the rest, but it checks in just the same way as it does usually with a little, little thinking about what that different means. And you get something which is invariant under the first and second, under the second and third Reitermeister moves. And when you go to the first Reitermeister move, Of course, you get something to calculate. So what happens here? If we calculated this, then we would get A times this plus A inverse times uh, that. And I'm keeping track of my stipulations about coloring. So this goes away. It's said colored differently from itself. On this one, um, uh, what is this? This is the same situation again. If this is red, this is green. But if this is green, then this is red. So, and this would contribute one in each case. So this is just going to go to A times anything that can happen to that line. So you conclude, unlike the bracket, it's not minus A cubed, it's multiplying by A. And if you were to, multi if you were to do this one, then it will multiply by A inverse. And so you can normalize it with the rive. And then um, what, uh, what happens is that you can check that, um, that the binary bracket of K is essentially equal to, um, I'm worried about a factor of two, up to factor of two because of my up to two. Um, it's equal to a to the rive of the knot um, uh, in the classical case. Not yeah, so once you normalize it, it's just one. But in the virtual case, then it will give you a to the odd rive. of k. Again, up to some factor of two. There might be, I forget, a factor of two in the exponent or, or a factor of two on the whole thing. I don't want to worry myself about it right now, but you get the odd rise. That's if this is one component. And we're familiar with the odd rise. For me, a long time ago, that's how I discovered the odd rise. I mean, one could imagine just discovering the odd rise directly by thinking, oh, if I counted the odd rod, I'd get something that's invariant. But in fact, this is how I bumped into the odd rod. I was thinking about this invariant, um, trying to make this invariant, and realized I was getting the odd rod in the case of virtuals for one component. And then for multi-components, bracket k virtual is an invariant. Um, and at least I don't know uh, another formulation for it. Okay. I mean, it'll give you a polynomial and it's an invariant, but. I don't know, like in the odd ride, we could lift the odd ride out of there 
and say it's the odd ride and I don't have to think about this invariant anymore. But in the case of links, uh, that's another matter. There might be a, uh, another formulation that would capture it. But let's look at a link just to see how things go there. Maybe we'll um, put a virtual crossing there and another one there. And I think that, let me see now, that goes through one, two, three. Let's put another one there. I should have looked up one of my favorite examples. Let me try again. That's too easy. Pardon me. You might as well just get one. Sorry to hold you up, just a moment. Okay. I'll put this in the Dropbox, by the way. Um, okay, there's a good example for us. So examine this, you're looking at it here. Here is one that I call the virtual whitehead link. And the reason I was um, getting a little bit confused in my calculations, as you see, we want to be able to color it. And you will notice that upon coloring it, you see here are two virtual crossings. And, and you start here and you want to go through an even number of uh, actual crossings as you come back. 
So the placement of virtual crossings is important. There are going to be examples, and let's go back to the Blackboard for a moment, um, which we'll fix up when we do the slides uh, for, for this. But suppose that I had given you uh, this virtual link, and I had said, well, what can you tell me about coloring this one? Well, then you would say, oh, I think I'll color it. All right, let me try coloring it. So I'll call that red. Uh, oh, I get right back to red, but red is supposed to turn into green. All right, so this is not colorable. Now that's just fine. Um, um, uh, this is not colorable. And on the other hand, this unlink, this is certainly colorable. So, uh, so the binary bracket distinguishes um, someone who is not colorable and tells you that it must in fact be non-trivial. And this is because of oddness in the self-linking that you're seeing there, oddness in the, those counts. But on the other hand, suppose you have an example like this where it is colorable, and then we can examine this and see what happens. Well, um, uh, as you walk along uh, this whitehead link, you see there are exactly two basic states that are contributing. I orient one of the components the same way, and I look at the two orientations of the other component, which correspond to the two ways of coloring the other component. And then each one contributes to the polynomial. So in this case, you see that this is going to contribute an A inverse, and this is contributing an A, and this one is contributing an A inverse. So we get a total contribution of A inverse from that one. And over here, this is contributing an A, and that's contributing an A, and this is contributing an A, so we get an A cubed. So the raw score for this link is A cubed plus A inverse, and that's proving that this link is non-trivial, and that's the way things go. And the multiplicity of orientations means that uh, you get an actual polynomial, the multiplicity of orientations. But we're also looking at the Lee cycles, as you can see. So this is the reason I bring this polynomial back into order here, was because it is looking like it's Lee cycles, but Lee cycles for what? Well, the answer is it's Lee cycles for a different virtual Kovana homology theory than the one that we've been using so far. It's the Lee cycles for Rushworth's theory. And so I need to be telling you about Rushworth, but what I'm telling, I'm trying to tell you things in some order. And so I'm telling you about the uh, self-linking polynomial first, and then we will in fact talk about Rushworth as the time permits and things go along. But I'll tell you a little about Rushworth later today, in fact, but not the whole story. So, so now you see we have this polynomial, but I want to digress a little further in the direction of the combinatorics. So you see, we had we had a something which looked like this. Colored differently. Colored differently. And the value of a loop was equal to two because it's two colors. And you could ask, what about more colors? And the answer seems to be harder to make
invariant under Rademeister moves, harder to make not invariants, but something to think about for combinatorics, for graphs. And to show you what I mean, let me digress a little bit. Digress and talk about three coloring trivalent graphs. Okay, so, so I'm now going to talk about a graph theory problem. And the problem is a very well known graph theory problem. You have a maybe you begin with a planar graph, but um, since we're going to color the edges, it doesn't even have to be planar. You may know about this. Here's I'm just drawing an example of a trivalent, three cubic, in other words, three edges coming into a vertex graph. And I'm going to use three colors. So my colors will be red, uh, green and uh, blue, let's say, okay. And the stipulation is that you want to have three distinct colors at each node. Now, this is a classical problem. Um, this is really the problem behind the four color theorem although I'm talking about three colors and I'll explain to you why, but let's just, let's just in the interest of time, not go reformulating it in terms of the four color theorem today. I can make that remark to you easily. Just look at it as a puzzle in its own right. So I might do red, blue, green, and red comes around here and the green is touching this one. Um, uh, so maybe I should try blue here, and then green, blue, red here, and I have a blue here and a red here, so this had better be a green, and then blue, green, red, and, um, and now I have red uh, touching this, and blue and red touching that, so the only thing that could happen is green, and then this would be blue, and I uh, managed to, by some luck to color it, right? Um, I managed to color this with three colors. So the problem is, um, when can you color a graph with three colors? And how many colorings are there? And as I say, um, there are, Oh, well, I didn't say, but there are cases where you can't color a graph, but the uh, simpler cases are obvious why you can't. If, if there is a disconnecting edge in the graph, if there's an edge in the graph so that if you remove it, it falls into two parts, then you, won't, then you will not be able to color it. For example, here, this could be red, but uh, there's no way to color that edge because there's only one color on that edge and I'm supposed to have three colors at the vertex. So this is uncolorable. But the four color theorem is equivalent to planar and no isthmus is colorable. Okay, that's the four color theorem. It's equivalent to the four color theorem. So if you are looking for um, your own proof of the four color theorem, you might take it in this category as many people have and try to prove it in this category rather than the usual category of graphs and colorings. And one of the people who, who did so um, try their, heart, their hand at at getting at the four color theorem in this way was Roger Penrose. 
I told you I have a digression going here. But you'll see how it comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Penrose created a formula that counts three colorings. Color rings of trivalent plane graphs. And if they have an isthmus, it'll come out zero automatically. And his formula looks like a skein relation. It looks like this you have an edge, an edge somewhere in the graph. And this just indicates that this goes off and connects to other parts. And then this is going to be equal to the result of removing the edge completely, smoothing it, plus replacing it by a crossover, which you may as well think of this as a virtual crossing. That is, it's a graph theory virtual crossing. Uh, it's not, uh, the edges of the graph are still going this way. It means that the resulting graph diagram may not be planar, but that's all right. You keep on calculating the same way. And then the value of, of a loop, if there ever occurs a loop with no vertices on it, is equal to three, not two, three for the three colors. And um, I made a, 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 a very bad mistake right there. If it had been plus, we would have solved everything, but it isn't plus, it's minus, okay? Well, let's see that this gives a result that's correct for some small example. Take a theta graph like that. Hmm? Oh, I should have drawn it the other way. So let me just turn it around a little bit. So then you can think of it as analogous to that orientation there, no different. And then according to the Penrose formula, this is the same as the valuation of this minus the evaluation of this. And now you will understand my syntax, my conventions because I take this to be three squared and the other one to be three. The value of a loop is three means the value of a possibly self-intersecting loop with virtual crossings is still three. And this is nine minus three, which is six. And that's correct, as you can verify by thinking directly. Three possible colors for this edge, then two for this, and then one for that. Three times two times one is six. And another example, the dumbbell. Well, if you apply the Penrose method, I seem to want to apply it horizontally. So you can get used to smoothing it in any direction that constitutes a smoothing. So that's the smoothing minus the crossover. But now you see it's three minus three, which is zero. So, so the theorem is that if, if G is contained in the plane, really embedded in the plane, no virtual crossings, trivalent, then the Penrose evaluation of G by this method up here, is equal to the number of three colorings of G. Okay, so um, this is um, a great uh, little field all by itself. Um, there, we, I, I think I don't want to prove Penrose's formula for you right now. Um, I wanna go on and talk about something that brings us back to where we started today. But um, if you haven't seen it before, you will see it when you look in the Dropbox because I will include 
the paper by Penrose that talks about this. Um, but uh, you see, you could, if you believe this formula, you could start investigating the coloring because if you want to prove the four color theorem, then all you have to prove is that this will never be zero when you have a graph without an isthmus that's in the plane. But beware, it's not likely to be easy. Um, Penrose bracket G does not work always. Sometimes works when G is not planar. I could tell you how to fix it, but that's another story. Um, an example is this graph. Which with lack of imagination, I'll call it G again. But this G is sometimes also called K33, uh, or the gas, electricity, water problem graph. It's not planar. Um, it has 12 colorings. But Penrose evaluation on G is equal to zero. If you configure it in the plane like that with a virtual crossing and do your calculation, you'll find out that it's equal to zero. So there's an exercise for you. Find some colorings of this and show that Penrose will call it zero. But as I say, Penrose does work when the graph is planar. And when it's not planar, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, so if you go and prove that it has colorings and yet nevertheless Penrose tells you zero, then you have actually proved that this graph is not planar. There are many proofs that it's not planar. Um, okay. So, so now I want to show you um, what I call the tautological coloring formula. For trivalent graphs. And now you're going to feel like you're coming back to where I was talking about. I'll, I will use curly brackets for this. And again, it's, it looks similar to Penrose. But this means the set of colorings of this is equal to the set of colorings of the smoothing, where these are colored differently, plus the set of colorings of this, where it's crossed over, but colored differently virtual crossing in there, and I'm allowed to try to color it. And this means union, disjoint union. And this is coloring set, the set of colorings. So actually, in a way, the logic of this is in back of Penrose, but this is more general. This is true for any trivalent graph in any universe, doesn't have to be planar. And you're going to see in a moment what I mean by it. But you see it has a family resemblance, does it not, to our binary bracket.
So suppose you had a coloring of a graph. Maybe it is red, green, blue, red, green. That's one possibility. I suppose the edge here is blue. Um, another possibility would be that you would have a blue edge in the middle and you would have a red and a green here, but you'd have a green and a red down here, the other two colors. So if you, if you, if you assign a third color to the middle line, then you end up assigning two colors to the other lines and they might permute. Now, in this case, I could look at a coloring of this where this was red and this was green. And I'm told that these are different. And as long as they're different, I can squeeze them together and use the third color in the middle. And in this case, I could have a coloring of this structure and, um, and uh, I would squeeze it together in the middle. And, and uh, this one happens to be red and this one happens to be green. And there you see the kind of coloring that I'm doing on a crossing. But if you squeeze it in the middle, you can put in the third color. So, so this is, this picture here is the proof of the tautological identity. Right, that's the proof, no problem. That's all that can happen. So, um, so all I'm saying is that what happens at a given uh, a configuration like this is that you're going to get a pair of colors here and the same pair of colors here, but possibly in this order or in this permuted order. And so that's all the tautological identity says. But it's a curious matter, is it not? Let's suppose that you were coloring something as simple as this. Then uh, you might have um, you might have um, um, smoothed it one way, and you find there are colorings of that, or you might have cross smoothed it like this, and then there are no colorings of that. So. So now you know that all the colorings of this are the colorings of this, where this is different from that. And now you see the six again, three times two is six. But if you take a more complex um, example, uh, you can do the same thing. Let's try it out on a more complex example. I just draw a random example, more complicated. A little more complicated. All right. Now, having chosen that example, I want to, um, I want to use this idea of the tautological um, expansion. So what I would like to do is I would like to choose, I would like to choose a good subset of, I would, let me explain. I, I would like to choose a good subset of these. According to the Penrose, it doesn't matter which subset I choose, but I'm going to choose a good subset. So let me mark them like that. So let's say I choose this one. If I choose this one, uh, then I won't have to choose this one, um, but maybe I should choose this one. And then having chosen that one, I might choose this one. Um, and I want to keep their endpoints distinct from one another and use all the endpoints in the graph in the process. Maybe that one and that one. And this one. 
and this one. There's a possible choice. You'll notice that every vertex is living at the ends of one of these choice edges, um, every single one. Um, I have missed no vertices, and no two of these are bumping into one another. This is called a, um, let me make sure. What about that one? Well, that's got an edge here. We're okay, we're okay. Yeah, this is called a perfect matching. A perfect matching um, is a choice of edges in the graph so that, um, so that every vertex in the graph is chosen by one of the edges and the edges are all disjoint. So just to make a little care in our drawing, just so we can see it better, I'll put a little circle around each of my matching edges. Because if there were a mistake, it would become glaringly obvious as soon as I put the circles in that I had not captured every vertex with disjoint edges, but I have, okay? Now there's the theorem. Due to tut, um, an originally uh, an originally earlier version due to Peterson, that every trivalent graph um, no isthmus. as a perfect matching. Now, you see why I'm interested in the perfect matching, because if I do a, then I could do my Penrose, my, uh, my expansion, my tautological expansion or a Penrose expansion for that matter. I could do it by saying, this shall be equal to this, right, plus this, or more complicated polynomial things in the Penrose. Um, and I do this, I expand it once for each of these, and I get an expansion of two to the n diagrams, and then one, and then if the, if the graph is colorable, then one of those diagrams is colorable. And I, and I translate the problem of finding all the colorings of the given graph into a problem of coloring different collections of circles that have been asked to be colored differently. Very interesting to explore. And in the case of the Penrose, we evaluate those because of the minus sign. We simply evaluate those and count the number of circles that are in each one of these states. So this, gives, this lets us take a state sum expansion for the Penrose. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter for the Penrose which perfect matching you choose. Isn't that interesting? And I suggest you try it out. Um, smooth these and see what the colorings are and find out about the colorings of this big graph that we drew here. Um, and we could do a smaller example for ourselves right now if we wanted to. But now I want to make uh, an, a point about this. Um, There's more than one way to make this point. Um, uh, I will just do it directly this way and you'll see what I'm going to do. I am going to map graphs to virtual knots, virtual links. I'm gonna call this K. And, and we're going to do it in the following way. K applied to a perfect matching edge. In order to be well-defined, I have to choose a perfect matching. So graphs with perfect matching is going to be equal to 
want to get the room on the slide, it's going to be equal to putting in a crossing and a virtual crossing. Okay. Now, that might look a little weird, but you see what the idea is. The idea is that expanding on this is like expanding on a crossing. And then deciding on a particular way of doing it is just going to map it into something familiar for me. And you'll see what happens in a moment when I do it on the next slide. Let's find out, for example, what would happen if I map my tautological expansion over into knob theory in this way? Or what would happen if we map Penrose in that way? So K is going to take this to this. Or another way of putting it is that K is going to take this with a virtual crossing next to it, which is allowed in our graph category, as we said, and that, that was supposed to be a perfect matching edge. And this is going to go over to just a crossing. All right. Now, on the other hand, when we when we did Penrose, for example, then uh, what happens to this? This goes to this minus the crossover, which was a virtual, and the other one. Remember Penrose written in virtual notation was okay. So so this guy will go over to this minus this, which is equal to this minus this, yeah? And that's going to correspond to a crossing. So, so in knots, in knot diagrams and link diagrams, virtual diagrams, we would have a bracket which said, this is going to be equal to this, minus this, and the value of a loop is equal to three. And this is Penrose. This is Penrose written in knot diagrams. We've translated Penrose into knot diagrams, and it looks like a bracket expansion um, with non-standard coefficients. Not not actually a, a strange event, right? In, in relation to the bracket, we are familiar with the bracket using some coefficients to get the Potts model and statistical mechanics, and it's related to the Tut polynomial and so on. And here, it's giving us exactly the Penrose bracket, <coughs> if the virtual knot were the image under the K mapping of uh, of the graph that we were whose um, whose whose coloring we were trying to find, um, so so you see we're 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 getting into a, a region that's exactly close to what we want to think about. Um, 
Now I'll go to the, uh, the tautological one in a moment, but let's just see what this is going to look like in practice. If you were to take this graph and run it over by the K, um, uh, then it will go to, that becomes a crossing and a virtual crossing, right? Um, this goes that way and this gets closed over. And the virtual crossing in this case is um, of no use and it just becomes a little figure eight. And so this is K of our graph, which I'll just call K. Hmm. Ah, yeah, that's our graph, G. And if we were to calculate the so-called bracket this way on it, then let's see what we would get. We would get that the so-called bracket of this is going to be equal to two loops minus uh, um, um, mm, one loop. Smooth and smooth, and that's equal to six again. Nothing changed except the language a little bit in this case. Okay. But if you do more complicated examples, it will be quite interesting. On the one hand, you have you have this kind of Penrose, simple Penrose expansion, not topologically invariant, but it, you can investigate how does it behave in under Reitermeister moves. Of course you can. And, um, and if you were, could only understand, and that's the rub, what, and so let's write the question. The question is, What subset of virtual diagrams virtual link diagrams correspond to planar trivalent graphs, planar graphs? If we could understand that better, then we might be able to investigate the four color problem with a variant of the bracket off in the plane. See? Um, well, now let's look at the tautological expansion. So, for the tautological expansion, we would have this. And we're going to put um, a crossing next to it. And then in the tautological expansion, that will be the same as the tautological expansion of this, where this is colored differently, plus this, where this is colored differently. And uh, what am I doing? I'm crossing over. And this one can also be regarded as virtual. There we go. So this translates into something quite simple. It says parallel lines colored differently plus uh, parallel lines this way colored differently, right? And this is the expansion of, of this crossing um, because this goes by the K-map to this. So the not theoretic version, so this is the virtual not theoretic version of the tautological expansion. And as you see, this is exactly what I was saying. It's the binary bracket type expansion where there are many possible colors, in this case, three, right here we're using three colors and three colors is not, three colors is not um, going to give you a topological invariant of knots and length, but two colors does. And what happens with two colors is you can see what happens with two colors because if you restrict it to two colors like red and green, 
then you only get those uh, colorings that for the original graph that where, where the perfect matching edges get blue. So there are uh, some sub-collection of the colorings of the, of the graph in the plane where all of the perfect matching edges that you chose get blue. And, um, and you would be enumerating those with the topological bracket. So the topological bracket is actually related to the topological binary bracket is actually related to the three colorings, but it only gets a certain subset of them um, where the perfect matching has been chosen. In other words, there may be many perfect matchings and you have to find the right perfect matching that will correspond to the coloring. So, so you see that what we have shown here is that um, that full coloring of a trivalent plane graph corresponds to um, um, corresponds to uh, many choices of perfect matching and binary bracket polynomial. So the actual relationship between the binary bracket and the colorings of the plane graph are not obvious. It isn't obvious that you can just directly investigate coloring by using the binary bracket, which is topologically invariant. Nevertheless, this is closely related and we'll see that the relationship between perfect matchings of graphs and things about the binary bracket and the Jones polynomial are closely related as we talk about this a bit more. There, that K-map is important for interrelating the graph theory and the topology. Um, the binary bracket polynomial, which we might call binary bracket polynomial, um, that guy um, is, is categorified to Lee homology via Rushworth. And so I thought that even though we haven't finished doing the detail about the Rasmussen invariant and so on, since we're talking about the coloring and the Lee homology, it would be worthwhile to tell you about the Rushworth structure. And so uh, you will find that Rushworth's paper is also going to be included in this week's um, in this week's thing, and that I will tell you more about Rushworth next time. So, what Rushworth does is he remember the single cycle map. So you have a single. We have to deal with single cycle map uh, when we're when we're worrying about. Uh, virtual covanov homology. And Rushworth has a non-zero single cycle map by changing the module structure. I'll explain how that happens next week, but he changes the module structure. He has a non-zero single cycle map he doesn't have to use local coefficients. 
And in the case of the Lee homology, that means that there are no cut points and that the colorings that the Lee homology provides are exactly the colorings that are in back of the binary bracket. So the binary bracket is actually getting categorified via Rushworth. And this may shed light on coloring problem, but I hope I've shown you how it's related to the coloring problem in a way that you could track a bit and play around with. But, um, but the full relationship with the coloring problem seems to go by way of these translations to graphs by choosing perfect matchings. And as a result, have a certain complexity that makes them hard to analyze. If it were easy, we would have gotten the four color theorem out long ago, but we are still as mystified as anybody else about that. So I'll stop here.